Welcome to our video, Japan and the World. The topic for this time is, can a U.S. arsenal handle conflicts on three fronts? I would like to focus on the Hudson Institute podcast, with Ukraine in Europe, Israel and Gaza in the Middle East, and Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific, the United States is staring down the barrel of wars in three different regions around the globe. Can America's modern arsenal of democracy support rising conflicts? If it cannot, are there enough allies with vested interests to join the efforts? Foreign Policy's Jack Detch joins host Marshall Kosloff to answer these questions and more. I'm Marshall Kosloff, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. My guest today on the show is Foreign Policy's Pentagon and National Security reporter, Jack Detch. Jack wrote a great piece of reporting on the challenges facing the Pentagon as we seek to rebuild the arsenal of democracy. As the United States faces potential theaters of conflict in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and of course, the Indo-Pacific. In the conversation, Jack and I discussed these physical and policy challenges facing the Pentagon, and of course, the different weapon systems and munitions that we need to address those conflict zones. The difference, again, is these factories have packed up, right? You had serial factories that were being converted to build guns, to build ships. You had Chrysler building tanks, you know, shipyards that were run by Kaiser. You had the Ford Motor Company with enormous factories to, to build weapons, to build bombers. You don't have that type of system. So, I mean, the fact that the world, that World War II happened right at the end of this hollowing out period economically in the Great Depression, you had so much slack capacity. Mm -hmm. You don't have that right now. So you actually have to kind of build this, this plane while you're flying it. Hope you all enjoy the conversation and you could find a link to Jack's reporting in the episode's show notes. Jack Detch, welcome to Arsenal of Democracy. Marshall, great to be here. Yeah, so I'm obviously biased, but you wrote a great piece of reporting on the Pentagon's efforts to rebuild the arsenal of democracy. Why do you think it was worth kicking off 2024 with a piece on that issue? Why is it going to be one of the defining issues of this year? Well, I think you just you look at the overstretch that the, the Pentagon is, is facing right now um, to basically be able to source weapons for three different conflicts, right? to help the Ukrainians fend off the Russians, uh, to prepare for a conflict if, if China breaks over the border into Taiwan. Um, and then, I mean, also everything that's going on with Israel. So it was just kind of this, this industrial conflagration almost that the United States is, is facing. It's not just the, the 155 artillery ammo that the Ukrainians are firing into Russian lines, right? It's the, the sea-launched weapons that the Taiwanese would need to, to plunk Chinese ships. It's all of these precision guided munitions that the Israelis are, are now firing in Gaza with, with tremendous consequences. So you just sort of see this, this scope of what needs to be revitalized. And while it's kind of this World War II moment, it's, everything is different, right? I mean, this, these are factories that have been boxed up, shipped overseas. Now you actually need to start this effort to basically reindustrialize and recapitalize um, to fight this, this three front war, basically or to help allies fight these different wars. So it's just this this enormous problem. It's like a math problem from hell that the Pentagon's facing. Yeah, I actually like how in the piece specifically, you kind of start out by articulating different measurements of success and the challenge. So if you're sitting in the Pentagon right now, how are you measuring the capacity and challenges in these different categories you just laid out? Yeah, so it's like in, the piece lays out, right, these different stair steps that, that Bill LaPlante, who's basically the Pentagon's industrial chief, is, is looking at in his office, these, these production charts for these different systems. He has 155 millimeter artillery ammunition the Ukrainians are firing and the Israelis to a lesser extent. He has these El Razums, these long-range uh, sea-based missiles uh, that the Taiwanese would need to fire on. Sam's, Gimler's, the, um, of course, the, the weapons that have been loaded into the high Mars batteries the Ukrainians are using. So just this enormous uh, amount of, of systems and weaponry uh, that the Pentagon is using. Uh, and these rates are going up and up and up. 
uh, the Americans have actually been moving a lot faster than the Europeans, even though the Europeans created a lot of political will to mobilize last year. Um, the European Union, for the first time in its history, became a major ammunition buyer, set this target uh, to go up to one million shells to be provided to the Ukrainians. Uh, they're going to get to about half that. But meanwhile, you see the U.S. revising up its timelines, um, getting to 100,000 shells a month by 2025, the end of that year. The problem is, again, we're in three hot wars right now. Two hot wars, one, one potentially to come. I should say. Yeah, especially from a deterrence perspective of the third one. I think an interesting debate that you kind of see around these potential three theaters of conflict are potential trade-offs. So to what degree do the challenges we face in Ukraine intersect with the challenges we face in Israel and Gaza with the ones in Taiwan? Yeah, no, this is this is a fascinating question, and it's a one that uh, I was thinking about a lot last year because you had this debate basically between a lot of former Trump administration officials, most most loudly Bridge Colby, basically saying, if you're providing weaponry um, to go up against a, a Ukraine fighter to help the Ukrainians fight, fend off the Russians, you're potentially sacrificing bandwidth weaponry that could be going to the Taiwanese. What we've heard from, from the Pentagon, um, from some pro-Ukraine Republicans on, on Capitol Hill, is that the math problem is universal, right? Like, the problem is fuses, gunpowder, shells uh, and it exists across the supply chain so if you're creating more of these things you're creating more inputs for all of these systems potentially now i think as you go further down the supply chain indeed there are probably significant trade-offs so i think the answer is probably you have a bit of both um you have some things where you are sort of trading one fuse for another fuse you are trading some systems for one weapon system and then you have the whole U.S. foreign military sales system, which has been entirely gummed up for years and years. The Taiwanese have a $1 billion backlog that doesn't just include um, these javelins, uh, these missile systems that have been going to the Ukrainians that can be fired over the shoulder. The, the Taiwanese are still waiting for their F-16s, for instance. So just this enormous backlog that's, that's basically facing the Pentagon that all other countries are sort of in the waiting line. And now there's kind of the question, too, right? Uh, it's not just sort of providing the weapons to the highest bidder, as was the case historically. The Pentagon and, and the administration and Congress are thinking about how do you make these different strategic trade-offs, too? Um, you know, if Saudi Arabia wants sea-based weapons, they might not be the highest strategic priority for the United States, even if they're offering up the most money. Yeah, and I think something you also did well is kind of articulate the differences um, from a munitions perspective between the three conflict zones. So in Ukraine, you're focused on the artillery. Um, in Gaza, you're focused on precision-based munitions. And then in Taiwan, the focus is on these denial weapons, such as anti-ship missiles. Um, looking across those three different categories of weapon systems, where do you see the biggest challenge in terms of like what we and our allies are kind of at capacity to address? I mean, the artillery is obviously the biggest one that, that people have focused on right now. I mean, when you look at the situation that the Ukrainians are facing, um, they've gone from basically firing 6,000 155 and, and Soviet era artillery rounds a day in the summer to about 2,000. The Russians are firing 10,000 rounds a day, and you already see the battlefield kind of converging on the Ukrainians. The Russians seem really poised to take this eastern city of Avdivka, of, of which would be their biggest gain since they took over Bakhmut last year. Um, so the, the need is obviously very urgent for the Ukrainians. Um, the need is obviously urgent for the Israelis, too. When you look at um, these precision-guided munitions, you just burn through them so quickly um, because they never actually seem to have the exact explosive effect that everyone expects them to. So when you look at, at the reporting that's come out of think tanks in Washington like CSIS, they think that you would run out of you know these precision guided munitions within a week of starting a hot war in Taiwan if the U.S. was indeed to actually come and back up Taiwan against a Chinese invasion. So I think there's criticalities across the supply chain. Um, 155 is going to be a huge focus this year. Um, and there's just the politics of this, right? We can't ignore the elephant in the room that um, this administration seems interested in doing this um, their level of investment might not be what, you know, some hawks would like to see. Um, it's a question mark if Trump were to defeat Biden, whether he'd sort of want to continue this industrialization strategy, curb it, 
I'll keep it going further, um, set, set it at point or, you know, just dismiss it entirely. So I think the election is, is really hanging over this. And, and when you talk to folks in Europe, there's a lot of consternation about whether this is going to continue or not. Yeah, and the Pentagon did not decide to collaborate with your deadlines. Um, a week after your piece, they released their first ever um, national defense industrial strategy. Did you take a look at it, and do you have any thoughts on it? Um, I haven't had a great look at it, and credit to um, Joe Gould and, and Paul McCleary at Politico, um, great colleagues on the Pentagon beat, who scooped me on a draft of that at Reagan. So, like, you guys were all working your tails off, and Marshall, like, I couldn't even catch you at uh, the Reagan conference where this piece came together because you were just, you were so much busier than I was. So I, I think the, the case in point is I just need to work a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess that's a good kind of turning point then. Yeah. So you, I was at, you know, listeners of the podcast will know that um, I was at Reagan um, doing eight hours of recordings, but you were actually like, speaking to policymakers and folks like in this space. What was the mood around this arsenal of democracy category at the Reagan Defense Forum? I think there was a lot of optimism about it that didn't necessarily necessarily reflect the numbers. I mean, I, I think when you look at, at what's going on, right, you see sort of these different plate tectonic movements. So you see a lot of collaboration, cross-country collaboration, cross-institutional collaboration that didn't exist before. Um, you see the Germans basically kind of using the NATO hat to mobilize um, NATO members to actually produce more patriot um, missiles that, that can be fired out of Patriot batteries that the Ukrainians have. Um, you see interest in the Czech Republic to basically backfill some of this ammunition shortage of, of 155 by actually going to countries, even countries that still have good relationships with Russia, and saying, hey, look, we need more 152 Soviet-era ammunition to help the Ukrainians continue firing at pace. So you kind of see a lot of creativity and a lot of bespoke solutions even with the Ukrainians, right, they're firing kind of these, these so-called Franken-Sam batteries, which are basically, they take the, the American battery, fire Soviet projectiles, or vice versa. Um, they've built these, these drones that basically can go up to 600 miles, uh, can detonate with, with high levels of explosive. And that's one of the ways they've been filling the gap, too, is without the artillery batteries that they need, um, they've been using these kamikaze one-way hit drones to hit into Russian lines. Um, the problem is you can't produce them fast enough. You can't fire them fast enough. You can fire, what, one, uh, five 155 cartridges in a minute. Um, you certainly can't fire as many drones into Russian lines in that amount of time unless you mass them before. So I think there's, there's an ongoing concern about how do you deliver this stuff en masse, is the political will there to actually keep it going? Uh, but certainly there was a lot of creativity and optimism around like what coalitions, what consor consortiums can you build? Uh, but one thing we've been talking about a lot in, in this administration, right, is the mini laterals that, that the UN Security Council doesn't matter anymore. It's more about the G7, the G20, uh, these little blocks that kind of get together, um, create diplomacy. It's not a, a fix-it solution for, for the lack of progress in the UN Security Council or in the General Assembly. Uh, and also we see that kind of in the arms space of these countries kind of getting together, creating bespoke solutions and, and providing them to the Ukrainians. The question is, how much can we give? I think what's interesting here, one of my uh, colleagues at Hudson Institute, Arthur Herman, is doing some interesting writing around reconceiving the World War II arsenal of democracy context as arsenal of democracies. Because Per what you just said, it's not just the United States that's producing these munitions. There's actually like an interlocking um, group of countries and allies that are kind of working on this. I guess what I kind of wonder, though, is that unlike World War II, the conflicts aren't quite as tied together if you are an American ally. So, for example, you can be an American ally like Germany and completely be oriented with us on the questions of Ukraine. But that might not necessarily mean you're oriented in the same way with Israel, Gaza, or Taiwan. So I guess the question for you is, to what degree does this sort of ecosystem of allies producing munitions, does this fit across all conflicts, or, there's, or is there potential for this to just be very conflict-specific when the actual problem the United States faces is that we have three different potential ones, as you said at the start? Oh, yeah, no, the, the, the three-way problem is, is an American problem in, entirely, right? There's, there's no real serious policymaker in, in Washington, inside, outside the administration, who thinks that there would be a serious European footprint backing up 
Taiwan um, if there was a war that, that kicked off in the Indo-Pacific or, or forget Taiwan, even over the second Thomas Shoal uh, between the Philippines and China or any other sort of hot war in Asia. It's, it would be the United States, potentially Australia, uh, potentially whoever wants to defend their turf, the Japanese, uh, the Koreans getting involved. This is very much European specific. Um, the Europeans trying to get their act together um, to focus on helping out Ukraine um, and the U.S. also providing weapons to, to Israel. You have a lot of split in, in the, uh, the European body politic about how to respond to Israel, some states supporting Israel, um, some states not really as supportive, uh, and certainly a lot less product moving when it comes to uh, the guns, the weapons, the artillery. The other interesting dynamic, and, and you mentioned Arthur Herman, and obviously the um, uh, Freedom's Forge is, is sort of really uh, a keystone kind of book that describes the World War II era. Um, the, the difference, again, is these, these factories have packed up, right? You had, like, cereal factories that were being converted um, to, to build guns, to build ships. You had Chrysler building tanks. You had, um, you know, shipyards that were run by, uh, by Kaiser. You had the Ford Motor Company with enormous factories to, to build weapons, to build bombers. Um, you don't have that type of system. So, I mean, the fact that the world, that World War II happened right at the end of, you know, this, this hollowing out period economically in the Great Depression, you had so much slack capacity. Mm -hmm. You don't have that right now. So you actually have to kind of build this, this plane while you're flying it. Um, and that's the challenge that, that countries are going to continue to face is they're going to have all these other priorities, especially during peacetime, right? A lot of countries that are facing this problem Ukraine is not right up against their borders unless you're talking about the Baltic countries. Um, Taiwan is, of course, uh, another world away for, for many of us. Um, Israel is, is quite far away. So these aren't conflicts that are pro propping up on, on everyone's border. Um, and there's going to be a, a mix of isolationist views of people who are sort of more, more primate-focused, primacy, who, who want to respond with an arsenal of democracy approach. It's going to be a really complex political web to spin here. I think what's so interesting about what you just said is there's this question of, is this a money problem versus is this an actual, there are structural limitations on what you can do. Um, and given the history you just told, a literal structural limitation that's different than a money problem is the fact that we're looking at a defense industrial base that's been hollowed out from the 1990s onwards. So can you talk about like that context specifically? Because that's another limitation on the, we can't just treat this as if it's 1939 again. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think you look at the, the context too, right? I mean, this is, this is also Europe and the United States mobilizing um, to basically put NATO and NATO countries back on a war footing. I mean, one of the interesting things that we've seen rhetorically from European states, um, from the British military brass, the Swedish military brass, now the Polish military brass, basically in a succession of weeks, saying Europe needs to prepare for war, that, that comes with dusting off World War II era bunkers, that comes with building these types of munitions. Um, it's just, I mean, yeah, the, the challenge is really, really, really daunting. Um, and you have to actually build new factories. Um, the U.S. seems to be very focused on building this 155 factory in Garland, Texas. Um, that is, is one of the things that they're looking at when you look at Bill LaPlante, LaPlante's stair step in the Pentagon that will actually get them from, from where they are right now, about 28,000 to 30,000 155 shells a month to 100,000 in December 2025. The Europeans don't seem to have laid down any new production. There's been talk of um, production lines being restarted in Bulgaria and, and other places on the eastern flank, but we don't actually see these brick-and-mortar factories being set down on European soil, and that's going to be critical if this approach is actually going to succeed. So I think the big last question here is time frame. So in the um, National Defense Industrial Strategy report that was put out, there's talk of it, you know, two, three, four, five year timeline here, given the fact though that you, you know, if we were recording this episode in January of 2023, we'd, we would have not um, have been talking about a potential conflict in the Middle East. We would have focused on Taiwan and Ukraine, but clearly mm -hmm. the narrative in terms of world events is moving quicker than our policy expectations. So what do you think is the timeline 
um, or like the room for effort and error when it comes to the challenges you've articulated on this episode? I mean, it, it depends, you know, what, what school of thought you're in, right? I mean, if you, if you look at the, the people who are the most concerned, like um, the, Phil, the Admiral Phil Davidson's of the world, right, the, the Indo-Pacific Command Chief, who said to, you know, look at, at the window of the next five years, and that was a couple years ago already, but basically until 2027, um, when the People's Liberation Army builds up a force that's able to invade Taiwan, that's kind of the window that you're looking at. You are looking at a shorter window with, with China, especially because they've built so many platforms. They have the world's biggest Navy. At some point, they're going to have to take those platforms back to the shipyards, back to the maintenance facilities, uh, and begin actually restripping them, rebuilding them, uh, getting them ready again. Um, so I think that's sort of a tricky calculus if you're Xi Jinping looking at the Taiwan Strait saying there's not a huge amount of time where you can just keep building, building, building. Um, and continue this and in, in continue to put pressure in perpetuity. This, the Russians have the same gravity challenge too, right? They've been able to basically patch up their firing rates by going to North Korea, going to the Iranians, sapping their industrial capacity. That seems to have worked to a degree. The Russians are, are vastly outshooting the Ukrainians right now. It's about 10,000 rounds a day they're firing as opposed to 2,000 for the Ukrainians. But it's not clear they can continue that in perpetuity, right? And they also need bodies. They actually need to be able to call up people from villages uh, and get them to the front lines. For a long time, that didn't have a political cost for Vladimir Putin because he could basically go to the east of, of the country, uh, get, get people into uniform, send them out to fight. Um, and he could pay off a lot of these families, right? He could, he could pay them off um, to basically deal with if all of the the cost you know if somebody's killed in battle right he, the the russians could actually pay for their their lifelong salary they could provide them cars they could do those sorts of things it's not clear they have the capacity to do that in perpetuity either even though they're sucking up about a third of their gdp on their military so uh, i think that's the question you have to look at too is not just in in the calculus of the united states but also in the potential adversaries um the China as the Russias of the world, can they kind of carry out this strategy, this pressure in perpetuity, and what's their breaking point industrially? Perfect way to put it. Jack, thank you so much for joining me on Arsenal of Democracy. And I really suggest that all listeners who are tracking these issues actively take a look at all of your reporting at Foreign Policy. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Marshall.